Okay, my goal today is to talk about the Anthony Appiah paper, Why There Are No Human Races. Uh, here's the paper that we read. This is a picture of the first page. Uh, this is Kwame Anthony Appiah. Uh, he's currently a philosopher, also uh, so in the philosophy department, but also in uh, the School of Law at New York University. Um, he's a super interesting guy, one of the most uh, probably important and sort of famous philosophers, public intellectual, you might say. Uh, he's written on a lot of different things. Um, you can see videos of him on YouTube or watch a TED Talk. Um, there's a really interesting interview about him just talking about his life and growing up called What It's Like to Be a Philosopher. Um, that's your extra readings up on the website. You can, uh, he was raised in Ghana and his family is sort of important in various political um, capacities. And there's a famous story of him meeting Queen Elizabeth and uh, when he was a boy, other things like that. Um, so that's well worth reading. Now the paper that we're reading for today, um, there is just a short version of longer things. One uh, is a long section of his Tanner Lectures on Human Values, which he gave at Princeton. Uh, that was kind of written up into half of this book, Color Conscious, The Political Morality of Race. So there he argues that, you know, we shouldn't have race, that race is a delusion, it's not a, it's not a valuable concept. Uh, Amy Gutman, who's currently the president at the University of Pennsylvania, she responds in the other half of the book um, by saying that, um, look, it's important politically, say, to be fair. And to be fair, actually, we should not be colorblind. We should recognize the reality of race and make sure that, you know, the different people of different races are, for example, treated equally. Um, so that's a very long thing. And so we're reading just a shortened, kind of abridged version of that, uh, which is in an anthology edited by Elliot Sober called Conceptual Issues in Evolutionary Biology, which just has, I think, two papers on race. So. Uh, that's, the, that's the version we're reading. Now, what is the conclusion of the paper we're reading? It's nice to kind of have that in mind because after all, there's no abstract here to tell you that. Well, the conclusion is that there's no biological races. Now, you might think that's just, um, there's no biological races, but actually most of the paper is trying to convince you that race is a biological term, that the history of racial terms and racial terminology it refers to these essential biological divisions. There's different kinds of people. And those different kinds of people can be called races. But it turns out, Apia will argue, that there are no such divisions. And so therefore, there's no races. OK, so he gives kind of in the beginning two different things you might re mean, two different ways you might figure out the meaning of a term. I mean, they're, they're not completely different. They're obviously close. Most terms will turn out to be the same on either way of thinking about it. But uh, the first way we could try to define race is the ide ideational view of meaning. That is, think about the idea behind it. Um, so you might have these various criteria that determine the meaning. Beliefs that are kind of central criteria. Um, so for example, in the case of race, he says most Sub-Saharan Africans are of the Negro race. Most Europeans are of the white race. Most Chinese are of the yellow race. Now, chances are when you read this, you're going to think, what? I can't believe you're using terms, you know, yellow, Negro, that's ridiculous. Uh, part of it is that terminology has changed and, you know, he was raised in Ghana, things might be different. But actually, I think part of it is that he is doing that on purpose, trying to make you see how kind of shocking and antiquated some of this language is. And that's, that's really what we're doing. You know, saying that most Chinese are of the Asian race. Well, of course, they're Asian. That's a geographical thing. If you try to specifically link it to race, you have a harder time coming up with the term. Um, but also other things like that everybody has a race or that there's only a few races, right? You don't want a concept of race where it turns out that there's 7 million different races on earth, like everybody with even a different, slightly different skin, skin color is their own race. So you don't want that. So there's one way to think about an idea is there's just a bunch of these things we believe about it. And so we're going to try to satisfy all or as many of them as we can. That's how we know what we're referring to. 
Another way you could go is to kind of think about the reference of the term. On the referential view of meaning, what you're referring to, that is the meaning. And we figure out the underlying thing in the world that we're pointing to when we use those words. So a natural view of this is a causal theory. You can take philosophy of language and learn about some other theories, but a causal theory of reference is pretty central. Um, so you ask about what the causal explanation underlying the phenomena we're pointing to. So, you know, for a very long time, people used terms like water, <clears throat> but, you know, they didn't know what explained it, but they were actually pointing to H2O. Similarly, terms like electricity, acid, bird. So, for example, <clears throat> you may kind of understand what, you know, what a bird is, but if somebody says, um, I wonder, is a penguin a bird? Well, there's this kind of underlying thing that unites the birds and it's gonna turn out, yeah, penguins are birds. Um, also, by the way, many times these things are scientific terms. So for example, a pterodactyl is not a bird. It's, a, it's um, not a dinosaur even. I mean, birds are dinosaurs, pterodactyl is neither one. Um, so that, the idea is that there's these underlying features of the world that we kind of pick out with our terms. Um, actually require that these things exist. I mean, usually they do. Um, but, you know, for a long time, scientists talked about phlogiston or witches, and we assumed there was some underlying thing there, but it turns out they don't pick out anything at all. Um, arguably, that might be the case for something like God or for morality. Okay, so first, what's wrong with the ideal, ideational definition of meaning? Well, nothing's wrong, but if you had that, why aren't there races? The problem is that there's nothing that actually satisfies all of these important criteria. Um, so he talks about it in terms of things like, imagine somebody doesn't believe one of these. Is it that they don't actually understand the word? Um, maybe, uh, maybe there's some disagreement. Uh, so you think your race is determined by your parents. Well, that means that full siblings should be of the same race. But what if we have siblings? So uh, here, Anthony and Pia is talking about his family. So his uncles, I believe. Um, so his grandparents, I think one is from Ghana, one is from Norway. So his uncles, he says one of them is really white, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, everybody would think he's white. Um, another one is much darker skin. So you could imagine somebody, you know, thinking that they're different races. But if they're actually different races, then the race can't be determined by your parents because they have the same parents. So a Pia's point is just uh, actually definitional of race. There's, you know, they can conflict. They don't actually, they're not actually satisfied by anything. Now, maybe you could say, well, we'll just try to get as many of them as we can or all of them, but he thinks that's never really gonna work. You can't even do that. Now, what about reference? This is in a sense what he spends most of his time on. Um, it's gonna end up being a, a similar thing anyway. But the idea is to figure out what in the world actually corresponds to the underlying explanation of the thing we're trying to point at. And he, by thinking about the history of race and the way it's been used for a few hundred years, um, he argues that it's actually meant to be a scientific term. It's meant to be biological division. So ordinary people can use it and see it just like, you know, bird or mammal or, you know, cat or dog. Um, but we assume that there's these underlying scientific facts that, for example, experts could be aware of. Um, and we could be mistaken. So for, there's the phenomenon of passing. Somebody, we might, everybody might think they're white, but really they're black because there's some underlying features uh, that make people the race they are. The idea here is that human races are just natural kinds. There's a correct natural division of humans into the races, regardless of what people think. So we typically think that at the species level. So, you know, there's different facts that underlie the differences between humans and chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas. You may not know what they are. Uh, they're kind of complicated, but there is this natural division. Even if no one went around classifying them, in fact, they're different. Uh, many people think that about, for example, males and females. Um, we'll talk about that uh, in the next section of our class. But the idea is that there's this natural division. We didn't make the division, it was already there. We're just kind of recognizing it and using these words to, to pick out the natural classification, like different elements or different types of minerals. There's different types of people, same idea. Okay, so now to do that, to figure out what it is we're trying to pick out 
uh, say we're talking about electricity or acid, you need to look at the history of the terms to see what those words have been, what they're trying to pick out, what they're referring to, to see what we've been talking about along. So here, the modern concept of race um, is sort of used in the 18th century. Now, I actually gave you a piece that comes from the 17th century. That's, I think, the earliest known work where somebody sort of divides up the world into races. Um, but it really sort of became prevalent in about the 18th century. Um, the idea of the biological conception was there always from the beginning. The idea is that there, there are significant differences between different groups of people in intellectual, moral, and aesthetic talents, not to mention just physical, plain old physical attributes like skin color or hair texture or nose shape or eye shape. Um, but now we know here, this is a Pia's argument. Now we know there are, is no such division. There aren't these natural divisions into these different categories. Um, so there's no such thing as race. We thought there was, turns out there's not. Now, um, the burning air piece is just a little three page thing that I gave you. Um, I think you'll find it kind of shocking when you read it. And then you'll say, oh, well, this is a couple hundred years ago. Um, of course, he's gonna think that, you know, the women of this particular race are just naturally more beautiful than the women of this other race. And, um, of course, he recognizes there's variation in various things, but uh, it's important to recognize the extent to which different, it's not just physical, the different uh, moral, intellectual, aesthetic properties of the different races is there from the very beginning. Um, they're not just referring to, oh, people in different places, parts of the world have darker skin. It's not just that, it's much more to it. Now, Apia looks at Thomas Jefferson and, and other people like Matthew Arnold too, but um, if you didn't know, Jefferson is actually a serious scientific intellectual, um, one of the leading intellectuals and scientists of his day, actually. So he's a, a representative of, you know, an expert user of these racial terms. Um, so if, you know, when Jefferson says, I've never known uh, a black person to have any poetry or, you know, aesthetic ability or, mu you know, he says, now, of course, they're very good at music and other things. He's like, but, you know, and, and of course, the, their whole history of pain and terrible lives, but they could never write a poem. And he doesn't mean because they're not educated. He thinks that these are natural capacities, just like we might talk about different species. We might think, you know, there's some smart chimpanzees and there's some not as smart chimpanzees, but they're not going to write poetry. Uh, similarly, he thought blacks were just incapable of writing poetry. Um, Bernier and Jefferson and everybody, they're just representative of, of everyone. They just assume that the differences among the races were biological, not, for example, due to culture or the environment they're in. And they're essential. They weren't just these accidental, oh, by the way, they have different shaped noses. This is actually part of what makes them who they are. They're a different, again, they're a different kind of person. Okay. Um, now, they didn't know what actually underlied the difference. For example, you know, I think Jefferson talks about, you know, the blood or the, um, Bernier talks about semen because that's, that's their word for what ultimately causes people to have the properties that they have. Uh, in, the, in the late 19th century, uh, in the early 20th century, we would, have, we would have talked about genes. So, and the idea is that even before, you know, before we had an idea of genes for race, we had the idea that there would be that a person's race was determined by these biological things. Even if we didn't understand what those things were, we knew that, for example, they were heritable and transmitted and your race comes from your parents and you can't just change your race, you know, by, for example, going to school and, and learning something, you don't change your race. Um, now we know, this is a Pia again, he'll say, we are just massively mistaken about these differences. There aren't any natural biological divisions of people that answer to the concept of race. So races just don't exist like phlogiston or the ether or witches. There were, you know, people acted and the idea of witches was really powerful. You know, people were burned at the stake for being a witch. But we assumed that there was this underlying, you know, certain people were in conversation with the devil and had magical powers. But it turns out no one's like that. There are no witches. Um, here's other concepts that we talk about. 
like tachyons, things that can travel faster than light, or God, or moral facts. They might exist, but they might not. And the way that you could come to the conclusion that they might not is by you know, trying to find what the underlying explanation, the causal explanation leading, you know, that we're referring to, and it might turn out that there is nothing like that. That's what a P is arguing about race. Now, it is important to recognize that people are different. If you just come along and say, but not everyone is the same. Well, that's true. For example, people have different moral, literary, aesthetic talents. Um, but there, no one today would say those things correspond to races um, because they just, you know, they vary across, they cross cut what anyone would think go lo goes along with race. Uh, but there are other differences. There are genetic differences between people. Um, and for example, there's obviously differences in things like skin color, hair texture. Uh, now that we're aware of population genetics, we know about alleles that cluster in what we think of as race, like sickle cell alleles. Um, you know, in the United States, African Americans have a high frequency of the sickle cell trait. Uh, white Americans have a very low frequency. Uh, that's predictive of race, and that's why you can, you know, some people uh, think that in the future we'll have things like racial medicine, uh, medicines that are designed for people of particular races and not others. Now, um, what's wrong with saying, so look, therefore, there are biological differences, so there's races. Well, first of all, traits like these, certainly traits like, say, skin color, um, they vary more or less continuously. So in that case, it's with latitude. So um, there are just different parts of the globe where people whose ancestry is from that particular part of the globe will t tend to have a skin that's a little bit darker. But it varies kind of continuously. Um, people whose ancestry is from, you know, Spain is different than Fran France, is different than Britain, is different than Iceland because the latitudes are different. Um, and similarly, and on the other hand, you know, New Guinea is going to be the same as, um, you know, parts of India and parts of Africa and parts of. Um, South America. And so um, their skin color varies. It doesn't cluster into, you know, five key races. There's going to be people sort of in between. Um, and second, and, now, and that's going to be the same for hair texture or alleles like sickle cell allele. Um, they vary uh, continuously. So if there's a, in the, in the case of sickle cell, it has to do with, you know, the tropical jungle where there's um, insects, you know, mosquitoes that carry malaria. Um, but there, the things that are the same are not the same groups as with skin color. So first, they vary continuously. They don't cluster into groups. And secondly, if you classify by one, you get a cross-cut another one. So they don't, all, they don't go together. They don't divide up into the races. So you could pick one, say skin color, and just insist that that's what race really is. It just means skin color, and you can kind of forcibly group people and and then sure, there's people in between and you can say they're mixed race or whatever. Um, and you can get, that's what happens in, for example, Brazil or other countries where, um, for example, then siblings can just be different races, full siblings. One just has skin that's a lot darker than another one. And they say, uh, this person is black and this person is white or this person is mixed, um, even though they have the same parents. So many of our criterial beliefs will be false um, and they won't correspond to the groups that, at least in the United States in the 21st century, we typically refer to as you know, the races. And they don't, here's the really important thing for Pia, they don't actually play, these groups won't play the explanatory role. You know, skin color can't explain, it's not a useful scientific division. You know, sure, there's people with different skin color, but are those different types of people? You know, we don't go around talking about uh, there's tall people and short people, and those are natural divisions. Um, we recognize some people are taller than others. Similarly, there's some people have, are darker than others. But there's no biological importance, really, to height. I mean, I can come up with various things that it's correlated with, but it doesn't particularly matter. No one would think there's really three kinds of people. There's tall, there's short, and there's medium. Um, similarly, we shouldn't say there's, you know, there's three races or four, as Bernier said, you know, um, there's just aren't these natural divisions. Okay, so just to kind of sum up again, uh, the conclusion here is what's called an eliminativist view of race. Race as a term is actually meaningless. 
We are trying to pick something out, but we're not. So it's not true that uh, Obama and Oprah Winfrey is, are the same race. It's also not true that they're different races. There aren't races. That's not a real thing. Um, and the way you get that is by figuring out what you're supposed to be referring to. It's meant to attach to groups of humans with meaningful, essentially different biological, that is physical and mental characteristics. But there's no such groups, so there's no races. That's the Apia piece.